Welcome to Square Notes, the Sacred Music Podcast. Your chance to learn about the teachings of the Catholic Church on sacred music, both in theory and practice, through interviews, discussions, and music. Your hearts and minds will be lifted up and better understand what it means to sing the praise of His glory. And now, your host, Dr. Jennifer Donaldson Novitska. Hello, listeners, and welcome to Square Notes, the Sacred Music Podcast. Our bonus episode today is a little different from our regular programming, as we're sending along an episode from another podcast where I was recently a guest. Sequoia Sierra interviewed me for her show, A Culture of Beauty, on Spirit-Filled Catholic Radio. I talk a little bit about my background as a musician and my discovery of the Church's sacred music, and I also share some thoughts about beauty you might find helpful in explaining the Church's music to others, especially in relationship to our faith and spiritual lives. And I explain a little bit about the foundation and the work we're doing here at the Catholic Institute of Sacred Music. I hope you enjoy the conversation. You're listening to A Culture of Beauty, where we discuss the ways we can elevate and affect the culture through beauty. I'm your host, Sequoia Sierra. Today, we have Jennifer Donaldson Novitska with us. Jennifer is an associate professor and the director of sacred music at St. Patrick Seminary in Menlo Park, California, where she holds the William P. Mart Chair in Sacred Music and directs the Catholic Institute of Sacred Music. She serves on the board of the Church Music Association of America and is the managing editor of the CMAA's journal, Sacred Music. She was a co-organizer of the Sacra Liturgia Conferences in New York and San Francisco, and is a board member of the Society for Catholic Liturgy, and serves as a consultant to the USCCB's Committee on Divine Worship. Jennifer has given chant workshops in dioceses, parishes, and monasteries across the United States and Europe, including most recently for the monks of San Benedetto in Monte in Norcia, Italy. Before coming to St. Patrick's in 2022, Dr. Donaldson Novitska served on the faculty at St. Gregory the Great Seminary in the Diocese of Lincoln, Nebraska, at Nova Southeastern University in Fort Lauderdale, and at St. Joseph's Seminary in New York, where she developed an extensive musical formation program for seminarians and lay students. She also hosts a weekly podcast entitled Square Notes, the Sacred Music Podcast. Welcome, Jennifer. Thanks for having me. All right, my pleasure. So good to have you. So you have, I mean, an incredible background in music. So how, how did that come about? Like, have, Did you come from a musical family? What got you started along this path? Yeah, my, my family is, is mostly uh, musical as a hobby. But my, you know, my grandmother um, on my dad's side was an amazing person. She, she was a pianist. She played the church organ. And she was um, also very anti-Catholic most of her life until the end of oh, her wow. life. <laughs> Wow. When she converted to the to the Catholic Church, and unfortunately, she passed away when I was rather young. But uh, mm. we had so many great conversations, even while I was young, that I just remember and cherish. And I, I feel like uh, such a such a kinship with her. Um, you know, not only with her intellectual interests and her musical interests, but mm-hmm. I have a feeling that if you know she were still alive, she I I, I could really probably see myself um, easily mirrored in her. But my mom mm. always just thought about you know, the, the, um, importance of musical education and education in general. And so did my dad. Um, so they, they had me take piano lessons. And of course I went through the same phases that everyone did when they were a kid, you know, that they didn't want to practice. (laughs) (laughs) But, um, I think, you know, with some, with myself and so many other people, um, you know, if if you give, give it up, you always regret it later in life. So parents. Absolutely. (laughs) I am a regretter right over here. (laughs) Yeah, it's always worth trying to push through. And my mom did help me push through. And then I became really serious. Um, you know, I was practicing three, four hours a day in oh, high wow. school. And um, yeah, that's amazing. Then I Dedication. went to school, you know, <laughs> I thought I would be a, a, a chemist, actually. And then I, oh, wow. I discovered that I didn't want to be in a laboratory my whole life. I liked people too much. Right. And so I... I went into studying music in college. Yeah, it's a little bit of a different setting um, than being in a lab, for sure. <laughs> <Indeed>. <laughs> so then if, um, you know, your grandmother, who who definitely had a great influence on you in, in beautiful ways, but you mentioned being like somewhat anti-Catholic. So was, was, did you convert or were your family converts? 
Well, um, I grew up Catholic and my mom raised me Catholic. I went to Catholic school my whole life. Um, My dad's not Catholic, but he's always been so supportive uh, of everything that I've done. And and, um, yeah, so I I did grow up Catholic, um, Okay, but I discovered my faith in a very profound way, actually in Catholic school. Later um, in high school, I had some profound conversion experiences. And especially later um, when I was a junior in high school, I, I really discovered through the the teaching of of a priest who came um, Mm -hmm. to my high school to teach our religion class, and he used the Catechism of the Catholic Church as a textbook, and it was there that I really discovered that there was so much that I needed to learn and, and what a treasure our faith was intellectually, and it helped me you know, just answer a lot of those questions that a lot of teenagers struggle with. Right. And yeah. <laughs> and we all have to go through that where we have the, you know, a time in our life, I think, um, even even for cradle Catholics, where you it, it becomes your own, you know, where you have to answer those questions for yourself, even when you've been exactly. practicing all your life. So that definitely comes up yeah. at some point or other. So if it hasn't come for a listener yet, be prepared. It will. <laughs> 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 so so then, I mean, you you know, you studied that. And so then through college, you um, you you said you uh you know practiced piano more so were you like performing in you know orchestras or concerts and things or um like how how did it evolve to what you're doing now yeah so when i went to college i i think i just thought that i would you know be a high school music teacher and okay. um so i studied music education actually oh okay vocal music education um but i was mostly playing the piano and um, surrounded by a really great choral atmosphere. Um, you know, the Midwest is, is such a great, anyone who's who's grown up in the Midwest knows that kind of choral singing is kind of part of the DNA there. Uh-huh. Oh, wow. <laughs> and really? So it was, it was a, a really great um, experience. And, um, but then I, I went on to study piano at the graduate level for my master's and my doctorate. But when I was going to grad school, I, I took a class my first year of grad school called Music in the Church, and it was taught mm-hmm. by this preeminent Bach scholar and organist, Quentin Faulkner. Mm-hmm. And he had a fair amount of experience, you know, both in the Episcopalian churches, but also in the Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. And it was there that, you know, we covered a kind of history of sacred music. And, you know, this is at a public university, so it was you know, just from a sort of academic historical perspective, but I started asking a lot of questions and I was always asking him questions after class and he was very patient with me. And, um, he started just encouraging me to read a lot of things. It was there that I read for the first time, the documents of Vatican II on the sacred liturgy and sacred music. And Mm -hmm. I was surprised (laughs) at what I read. Um, like, why are we not doing this? (laughs) Well, it was very different from my, my experience. And I, I just, right. I felt very convicted that I, I had so much to learn that I, I just didn't really know existed. Cause I, you know, I really, when I uh, first started doing music at mass, I, I actually got my start in church music, playing the synthesizer in our folk group. Oh. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and uh, I played piano very faithfully and, and, and organ um, uh-huh. throughout high school and college, but, but this discovery really, um, just sparked in me a conviction that, you know, the church was speaking very clearly yes. um, to the church and to, to my heart. And I, right. I really had so much to learn and I, I had better do it. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> so it kind of started me on a different path. So you felt that call to really take kind of what you learned about those documents and Vat- the Vatican II documents and really apply it. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's the experience of so many people Mm -hmm. uh, in the church that, you know, they grow up with, um, you know, an experience of music that's based on maybe more contemporary or modern hymnody. And um, they grow up just doing things the way that their their church, um, their particular parish has done them. But I, I don't know that they always have an experience of hearing the church's vision for the liturgy articulated very clearly to them. Right. And so, um, you know, they, they go along doing the things that, that they think they should do. And then, you know, more and more people I think are discovering, um, you know, there's a, there's kind of a broader vision here um, that imposes itself on the heart through its, its clarity and vision and meaningfulness. And that it's, it's, uh, there's so many good fruits that come whenever we follow our Lord's call to see things in a more deep or profound or bigger way. Exactly. 
Absolutely. Well, and also for some of our listeners, because I, you know, just realized too, I, you and I know a lot more about um, what sacred music actually is. But for somebody who, because you know, if you really think about it, in your average parish, we don't really have that experience of true, authentic sacred music, unfortunately. Um, so, how would you explain or define it to somebody who has no idea what we're talking about? I would start by saying that. Um, the church has a sort of native musical language of its own, mm -hmm. um, and that is Gregorian chant. And um, we can look at Gregorian chant as having particular historical roots in a varied geographical and chronological context, but it really grew up with the liturgy. So mm -hmm. any Roman Rite Christian um, who praise the, the Mass and the Roman Rites has as their sort of birthright this musical language that accompanies it. And that musical language mm -hmm. is something that um, not only makes the uh, text more beautiful and helps it sink into our hearts, helps it to um, articulate and express and redound to the glory of God more faithfully, right. but it also, it has a particular meaning in itself. Sometimes we think of the meaning of, of music only as the words, but we know that's not the only way in which music means, you know, otherwise right. we would never go to a orchestral concert. Right. But the, the Gregorian chants of the mass have a particular way of expressing the text. Mm -hmm. It helps guide our prayer, you know, and I think an easy to understand example is, you know, the, the Gregorian chant is translated um, quite ably into English. Um, so if people go to, to Mass in English and they hear um, the Lord be with you, they hear that in a couple of different spots in the Mass. Um, right. And in the greetings or before prayers, they might hear it sung, the Lord be with you. Um, mm -hmm. and kind of simple. And right. at another point in mass, they might hear it with a different melody. The Lord be with you. That heads into the preface dialogue. Right. And that simple difference of the music expressing it in a different way says that, ah, wow, there's something special about when you hear it this more elaborate way. Right. The Lord be with you. It's heading into sort of apex of the mass. Mm -hmm. There are just so many ways in which Gregorian chant helps us understand what's really going on, the mystery and um, flow of the Mass yes. in a way that's attractive, beautiful, and really more meaningful, um, adds to the meaning of the words of the Mass. It's really singing the Mass itself. Mm -hmm. So um, I would say that that's one of the biggest discoveries that we can make is that you know, we have this treasury of sacred music with Gregorian chant at its core, and then so many other beautiful kinds of music. It's not just Gregorian chant, but that right. really express what the mystery is that we celebrate. Jennifer, you were just, you know, explaining about um, Gregorian chant um, and a little bit more about what that is in terms of sacred m music. And I know I've had a few people um, that we've on the show that where we've talked about liturgical things and someone had mentioned, you know, like Leviticus and how God has a mode of worship in it. Like he wants us to worship him in a way, too. So it's not just about us wanting to worship God. We, we can't just do it just because we want to do something per se, but that God also wants to be worshiped in a specific way. And you see that in the Old Testament with those, if I remember correctly, I believe it was Leviticus <laughs> that would give these rules for how God wished to be worshiped. So is there also that element too with sacred music? Because I know there's a lot of people who would like a rock band sort of music, um, and that often is in many parishes because they feel, oh, well, that speaks to the youth more, or that's the way I like to do it. But it's like, well, but there's a reason why <laughs> we have certain things that are elevated when we're approaching God, who is this mystery. So can you speak to that as well as, you know, there's are there certain rubrics um, with music when it comes to the liturgy and that sort of a thing, too? Yeah, I think it's natural for us to come to any artistic um, medium with preferences and uh, experiences that shape us in a very profound way. But what I would say is that the most profound thing we can do is 
always orient ourselves towards God. And Mm -hmm. we can be like the disciples in the gospel say, Lord, teach us how to pray. Right. And, um, you know, uh, Christ is, is not present in the exact same way, uh, that he, he was to, um, the disciples for us to, you know, go to him and say that, um, but we can say that to him in our prayer and in our hearts and then ask, well, how does he do that? How does he teach us? Of course, he leads our the inner part of our heart. You know, mm-hmm. each of us um, in our prayer is led by God in a very particular way. Yes. But he also does that in a very concrete way through his body, the church. Right. And the church has a way of praying. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's something that is, Yes, shaped through uh, history and time, but it's also something that's shaped through the lives of the saints and and the, the promise of our Lord that he would never leave us orphans and the, the church's guardianship and guidance of, this, of the sacred liturgy throughout um, time and through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is a very concrete way in which he does that. So if we go to him with that particular spiritual attitude, Mm -hmm. Lord, teach us how to pray. Well, he can do that by particular things like perhaps like the experience that I had that we read what the church says in, in important statements about sacred music and saying, you know, Gregorian chant has principal place in Mm -hmm. the sacred liturgy. Right. And to take that really to heart and say, okay, if it has principal place, then it belongs to me as a Catholic. And then how do I really pray with that? And how do I really be shaped by that? Exactly. And it's, it's no longer about what I want or what I want to say to God, but as with so much in our prayer life that we bring a listening heart and we say, okay, Lord, Lord, really teach me and and inform me. And when we have that openness, the church can say, okay, um, let's form you in what Pope Pius X calls the supreme model of sacred music. Mm-hmm. And this model of Gregorian chant possesses a true sacrality that when we hear it, it has a sense of prayerfulness and transcendence and connection to God. Right. It has a sense of beauty that it's something that is authentically beautiful and can be perceived um, by any human heart as possessing something of excellence and, you know, that splendor of right. the form that, that the classics talk about. It has a clarity, an integrity, a proportion. Mm-hmm. I can perceive those things through my intellect. And I think so often we're a little bit afraid because we have particular preferences we're afraid to let go of those things because we feel like we're going to have to give up part of ourselves. Right. But this is, this is so much a part of our experience as Catholics about everything, whether it's like particular moral teaching or a doctrinal teaching or just something we're struggling with right. in a sense of prudence. You know, like we're afraid that if we let go of ourselves, we're going to lose ourselves. Right. But God is always faithful. And if we let go of ourselves, just a moment and say, really, Lord, teach me how to pray. He Mm -hmm. always gives us a very clear path that really fulfills the deepest longings of our hearts that is perhaps unimaginable if we never let go of our own preferences. Right. And for me, that that was my experience. You know, wow. I, yeah. I struggled when I started, you know, doing chant and, and singing a lot. I thought, you know, am I doing this just because I'm like some musical snob? <laughs> you know, I am a music student. I'm studying music. OK, maybe maybe I have some sort of like just right. predilection towards this kind of music. But then I really, you know, there was one mo- moment I remember, particularly in grad school, I was I was in the choir loft. I had gone down to receive communion and part of the school was just singing the communion antiphon and I was seeing people go up and receive communion and the, the priests um, giving communion and everyone like had their part to play in this kind of like cosmic symphony of right. liturgy. Yeah, and that's I was a good way to put it. Praying, <laughs> and I had a silence of heart. And everything felt meaningful. And I could listen to the school behind me. I could look at the beautiful art. Mm-hmm. I could pray and reflect on having received the, the Eucharist. I had a sort of interior freedom that, that really felt like, ah, 
this yes. is what God intends for us in the experience of the liturgy. Absolutely. Well, and I mean, that's a beautiful way to put it. And and even that that struggle, I think, is is something that it's kind of marks our current culture where we have a really hard time dying to self. Um, and that's reflected across the board in everything, um, even with people's fear of committing in marriage or whatever, because you, you do have to die to yourself in, in so many aspects of life if you want to actually be part of something beautiful and part of something transcendent other than yourself whether it's, you know, the music and the liturgy or even even like somebody becoming a parent for the first time, you know, they're going yeah. to have to die to themselves. But then they created this, you know, new life and this soul that they are going. It's perpetuating their their family. And so in, in a way to touch that transcendence, it's kind of a part of, of what we all have to accept that we have to die to ourselves to become a part of of that greater mystery, um, just as, you know imitating our Lord as well, you know, it's because it's, it's that same story in the sense of we need to imitate him in that way. Yeah. And I think this is, is a particular important message for pastors, you know, that they want to lead people to God and everyone has their own path, you know? Right. Um, and it might be that they turn to God in one area of their life, like they pray more or they um, develop a a habit which helps them overcome a particular sin or right. they see more clearly a particular doctrine of our faith that any particular turning towards the Lord, it, it really engenders like a, a whole turning of the whole self to our Lord. And I, I yes. think this is, is really important for people to understand that, you know, if you, if you really try to, heed the church's vision for her own sacred liturgy and sacred music. And you, you, you do things that feel a little bit like you're stepping really outside of your own experience, your comfort zone. You turn towards the Lord in this asking to teach us how to pray. Right. So you can just experience spiritual fruits in so many other things. Right. You know, that, that this, this experience of music at the mass, which is truly beautiful, which is truly focused on God and not on ourselves, you're going to start seeing the openness to God in other things, which are, you know, perhaps tough for a congregation, yeah. you know, whether it's no, the absolutely. church's teachings on sexuality and marriage or the teaching on, you know, the place of Our Lady or the real presence right. in the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. This is a turning towards the Lord that um, kind of revolutionizes the spiritual life or the life of a parish. Right. And we have to not be afraid to embrace the church in her fullness and what the church says. You know, I, I think that that lack of fear has to, to pervade our, our call to people to turn towards the Lord. And of course it has to be done in a, in a way, which is like, you can't just, you know, go into a parish and change everything overnight. Right. You really Absolutely. have to be formed by the church's liturgy. You have to right. say, Lord, teach me how to pray. And that formation shapes the heart in a way which helps you understand the spiritual good, not only for yourself, but for all your brothers and sisters in Christ. Exactly. And yeah. to articulate it in a way that's compelling and loving and beautiful and inviting. Yes. Yes. And it's just like a cascade of grace, you know, because like you said, that yes. turning of the heart, it just... It, it allows a whole flood of other things to, to happen and opening up towards God that way. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's that's beautiful. Well, we're going to have to have you back so we can talk further on sacred music <laughs> and the work that you're doing. But thank you so much for coming on the show today, Jennifer. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. You're listening to A Culture of Beauty on Spirit-Filled Catholic Network. Hi, this is Jim, the program manager with Spirit Filled Radio. And this program, A Culture of Beauty with host Sequoia Sierra, is a production of Spirit Filled Radio, a nonprofit ministry based out of the Diocese of Orange in Southern California, where we produce a variety of terrific faith based materials to enhance and equip you in your spiritual walk. 
To find out more about A Culture of Beauty and our many other offerings, please come by and see us at spiritfilledmedia.org. That's spiritfilledmedia.org. And if you are so inclined, please click the donate button at the top of the page to become a monthly donor or to give a one-time gift of any size to help us as we endeavor to continue to produce this kind of quality content each week. Thanks so much. Once again, that's spiritfilledmedia.org. Welcome back, Jennifer. Thanks for having me back. You're welcome. So last time we talked about sacred music, what it is, and just everything that surrounds it, the beauty that can happen in one's life when you open up um, your heart to um, worshiping God in that way. You recently founded the Catholic Institute of Sacred Music last year, I believe. So how did that come to be? Um, because, you know, all your your the different work that you've done in seminaries and the wonderful workshops, is this kind of, do you see it as a culmination or is this like another avenue of the work that you're doing? Yeah, so this is an initiative of St. Patrick's Seminary okay. in Menlo Park here where I am. And um, it was really brought about by a number of, of um, really visionary uh, people and their support for this. Um, you know, amongst them, the, the rector of St. Patrick's Seminary, Father Mark Doherty. Yes, um, I know him well. Uh, <laughs> he's, a good uh, he's a wonderful priest. <laughs> yes, he And is. also Maggie Gallagher, the, the executive director of the Benedict XVI Institute. Oh, and okay. also... Um, we're in uh, the Archdiocese of San Francisco here, so Archbishop Cordelione, um had a hand in, in all of this. In, Wonderful. Um, bringing me here to St. Patrick's Seminary um, to uh, found something to serve the church and her needs and her people. Um, mm-hmm. And that's the whole idea behind this. At the Catholic Institute for Sacred Music, there, our mission is to draw people to Christ through the beauty of the Mass, mm-hmm. the beauty of sacred music. And in my experience, just working with lay people and seminarians and clergy on these issues over the last, um, you know, uh, 10 to 15 to 20 years, I don't even know how long now, <laughs> wow. um, <laughs> I've seen a couple of, of real needs. Um, the first is the need for a, a, a real theological understanding and a historical grounding for um, the church's vision for her own liturgy. Mm-hmm. You know, we really have to understand the whole history of sacred music to make sense of, you know, what, why and how things are the way they are right now. Right. And we, we also have to always start from first principles and understanding, you know, why we do what we do, um, understanding the theology of, of beauty, the theology of the church's uh, liturgy, the theology right. of the worship of God, the sacrifice of Christ. Mm-hmm. So they're all really important things that, you know, sometimes um, the church musicians don't have. So one of the main things that I've seen is that a lot of people end up working for the church by accident. Right. <laughs> they have, <laughs> you know, they have um, one or two things that they bring to the table. One is, you know, maybe like a, a really strong uh, talent for music. Um, mm-hmm. This is particularly true in big coastal cities, you know, where I was in New York and here in San Francisco as well, you know, the people right. go to a big city and they want to make a career in music and they're out auditioning for stuff and they just need something to make the, the uh, pay the bills and right. so they end up working <laughs> for a church because it's a steady paycheck. Right. They really don't know very much about these theological or historical things. Yeah, that's um, true. And don't have a firm grounding in what they do. Right. Um, but they, they're bringing a lot of musical skills to the table that are, mm-hmm. you know, uh, possible gifts uh, to give to our Lord exactly. um, to make beautiful things. Um, the second thing is that, you know, sometimes people end up being music directors be- because they are just like willing, right. <laughs> willing to put in the time. Maybe they're good with people. They're great at inviting people mm-hmm. to participate in a choir. They have a like, you know, good people skills and organizational skills. Um, sometimes people bring both. But you can bring both of those skills to uh, the table, and those are great skills that the church really needs. Right. But they have to be formed by why we do what we do. And so, exactly. you know, over the past decade, especially, I've been teaching a class, you know, that I've called the History and Principles of Sacred Music, where mm-hmm. we really dive into these theological issues and these, mm-hmm. uh, this historical perspective to really discover how does the church think about herself? 
Mm -hmm. How does the worship of God work theologically? How can I think about that with concrete principles and not just, I do things this way because that's what I was told to do, or that's how, how we do it in our particular church or our particular parish. (laughs) Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. (laughs) And I have had so many profound experiences in that class with students of like opening up the doors of like, oh my gosh, I've been doing this for 20 years and I didn't really understand these things. And now that I do, I see a very clear vision for why I do what I do. And I have so much to learn, but I'm also so motivated because I see my place in it. I see what the gifts I bring to the table can do right. for the church. I see how I can pray and how I can I- impact the lives of others and bringing them closer to Christ. And so wow. that's a really amazing experience for me as a teacher and, and just to absolutely um, bring <laughs> other people to that, you know, um, whether they're kind of just getting started in their careers in the church, um, Mm -hmm. or they've been doing this for a very long time. It's such a formative and important experience. It's almost kind of like a profound conversion in a particular area of the life that for musicians is really at the core of our being. You know, I talk about this a lot with the seminarians, you know, um, uh, that hopefully they will one day be a good pastor for their music directors. And musicians have a particular experience of their art in a link to their vocation, because especially when you're a singer, your instrument is part of your body. Right. Yeah, (laughs) that's very true. You feel it in a very intimate and personal, personal way. And so it's really sometimes hard for musicians when they receive a critique, they really take it personally. You know, I I also noticed that in musicians, we have a lot of perfectionist tendencies because we really want things to be beautiful and perfect. And, you know, we, we have ears to hear and sometimes we we hear all of our mistakes and, you know, we want to do our best. So anyway, you know, like this experience of being a musician is, is really at the core of a person's heart if they're doing this. Right. So that, that grounding in why we do what we do is super, super important for musicians, artists. The other thing that needs to happen is that there are all the practical skills, you know, that if um, someone is seeing the church's vision for her sacred liturgy um, and they've never sung Gregorian chant before, well, I need to learn how to read square notes. I need to learn how to hear this. I need to learn, you know, what sort of vocal technique do I bring to the table? How do I direct this stuff? How do I form a choir? How do I structure my my parish uh, music program, what do I do for fundraising? How do I bring right. people in? All those sorts of skills, you know, and then wow. even beyond that into choral music. Okay. Like how do I lead a great rehearsal? How do I make good warm ups? How do I, you know, help people hear and sing well um, in, in parts? How do I um, play the organ in a way that's great in terms of accompanying singing, but also doing great improvisations that really add to the mass and then aren't just, you know, noodling away at filling that silence up. (laughs) You know, there's so many practical skills. And so this is my, my experience in working with people. Those are are two great needs that I see. And Mm -hmm. so this Catholic Institute of Sacred Music uh, is aiming to meet the needs of the church Mm -hmm. for musicians in a particular way. I was going to ask about it, like who can attend these? Because I mean, I've seen some of the topics and they look amazing. I wish I was a little closer because I would be there at all of them. (laughs) But, um, you know, you guys are a seven hour drive away. So, (laughs) (laughs) but, but yeah, so anybody who is able to, is, is able to attend though? So we have two varieties of of offerings. One, one is, you know, these graduate level courses that we're offering during the summer. Okay to fulfill those needs that I was just talking about. So, um, you know, you don't have to have an undergrad uh, music degree. It can be an undergrad degree in anything and take our classes. And um, we're offering 12 classes this summer. um, And those are, um, we have an amazing opportunity this summer to present those for free. Oh, wow. (laughs) Free tuition. That's amazing. And so some of the classes are completely online. You know, for Uh example, this history and principles of sacred music class that I was talking about is online. You know, it's like nine weeks. You just study at your own pace. And then two days we meet together 
um, online to okay. talk about more contemporary issues. You know, mm-hmm. um, Father Samuel Weber, who is a, an amazing colleague here at St. Patrick's Seminary, maybe some of your listeners know about him. Uh-huh. He's teaching an, a, com- a completely online Latin for church musicians class. There's another class, wow. Paris Sacred Music Program Management, on Wednesday nights that's talking about more of these practical skills. Um, Mm -hmm. But there are other classes that are completely in person. You know, this organ improvisation seminar, we have a composition seminar. Um, The organ improvisation seminar is taught by an amazing improviser, um, uh, Christoph Tietze. He's the music director here at the cathedral in San Francisco. And the composition seminar is going to be led by Frank LaRocca. Some people may know his Mass of the Americas or his other Masses that he's uh doing. And then we'll also have a choral institute that week um, where we get together and focus on on polyphonic music. Mm -hmm. And that will be directed by uh, Prof- Professor Christopher Berry, who's um, uh, from Wisconsin um, mm-hmm. at an institute parish there, and I'll be kind of sitting second chair to him. So that's mm-hmm. completely in person. But right. there are other classes um, that we actually have the ability to offer kind of a hybrid. Some of the students are going to be in person. Some of them are going to be online. Oh, wow. So anything that's online, of course, is available to anyone across the world. And so those are like our introduction to Gregorian chant. We have some advanced seminars in Gregorian chant on conducting uh, what's called pronomy, the rhythm of Gregorian chant, the chants of the divine office. And we also have a couple of another course that's the history of the Roman Rite, a historical class and then um, uh, we're offering also a public lecture and concert series, which, again, has the hybrid aspect to it. So you can come oh, okay. in person or attend uh, through streaming. Can all of this information just be found on the Catholic Institute of Sacred Music's website and people can register from there? Yes, exactly. So um, Catholic Institute of Sacred Music dot org or, org. In, or Institute of Sacred Music dot org, if that's a little easier to type in okay. the URL. Yes. <laughs> um, they both go to the same place. All the information, the dates, faculty and topics are available oh, already yeah. online. So you can make your summer summer plans. Wonderful. Well, we'll definitely put that in the show notes. That way our listeners can, um, who are interested, register or pass it along to those in church and sacred music. Now, Jennifer, we've talked a lot about, you know, um, sacred music and what it is and um, the incredible work you're doing. I'm really excited for the, the program and the workshops that you have going with the Catholic Institute of Sacred Music. But, you know, beauty is you know, an aspect of God um, and beauty can reach us all in various different ways. So I definitely love to ask different people who are in different various areas, such as what you're doing, what beauty is for them. So in terms of music, what what is beauty to you? So I think the most important aspect of beauty is that it's a sort of face of the splendor of reality. Mm. You know, as Catholics, when we look at um anything, we can see it not just for what it is. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we can see it from a scientific perspective. Mm -hmm. We also see a deeper reality. You know, when I look at the sky as a scientist, I can see weather patterns or I can see um, why the sky is blue. I can understand that from a a natural philosophy perspective. Mm -hmm. But I also see in the sky the experience of looking up beyond myself to mm-hmm. God and this idea of where God dwells, you know, so it's, what, right. um, it's often called the sacramental imagination. Mm-hmm. So we see the thing itself. We can see it with specificity and accuracy, thanks to our intellect and scientific knowledge. But I also see the deeper reality for what it is. And the experience of beauty mm-hmm. is a very concrete way in which the amazing existence of all that is can impress itself on our minds and our hearts. Mm -hmm. As as I said, the the sort of face of the splendor of reality. You know, when Mm -hmm. we think about what, what exists, everything is grounded in the logos, the, the kind of, it is the word of God, the second person of the the most Holy Trinity, Christ, Mm -hmm. the word of God. Yes. Um, But it's, it's a sort of, logic that unfolds itself before our eyes. And it's not just like the the logic that makes sense, but the right. logic and the reality that is, is it makes so much sense that mm-hmm. it attracts us. Mm-hmm. And that sort of refulgence of 
the uh, meaning of reality, the, the, the nature of reality, is what expresses itself in beauty mm-hmm. as it impresses itself on my mind, that it has, you know, a harmony. I can see the relationship between things. Mm-hmm. I can see the relationship of one thing to the whole. Um, right. uh, and I can see a sort of luminosity. It sort of glows in a way. It has a sort right. of inner light, inner refulgence that the, the scholastics talk about is claritas. Mm-hmm. And those things impress themselves on my mind. Sometimes they provoke an emotional reaction. Mm-hmm. You know, when I see right. something really profoundly beautiful, it can move my affects, my my emotions. Yes. But other times I can just be so overcome by beauty and not have that sort of emotional reaction, but still feel intensely captivated right. and attracted to it. And so... You know, I think it's important for Catholics to have a sort of clarity in how they see beauty, that it's not simply about something that moves my emotions. Right. It's something that that moves me in a broader way, Mm -hmm. that it moves my intellect. And beauty attracts me to the good, attracts me to the truth, and can order my emotions properly when I'm seeing uh, something that is beautiful, a beautiful face of something true and good. Exactly. Um, because sometimes it's really easy for Catholics to be confused by especially modern notions of beauty and think of it only as um, an emotional thing or mm-hmm. something that is about um, personal expression or personal taste. And it's so much bigger than that. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it does encompass those sorts of things too, but it, it's much broader. Right. You know, beauty isn't just in the eye of the beholder. It's mm-hmm. actually in the physical thing itself. You yes. see the beauty of the c- cathedral at Rouen, and I see the beauty of the cathedral at Rouen, and Monet saw the beauty of the cathedral at Rouen at four different times of the day. Right. That's why I painted it four different ways. And there's something in the thing itself that is beautiful. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, we couldn't talk about that beauty. Exactly. Um, and yet, I do need to myself experience seeing the cathedral at Rouen, and you need to be able to see it. Mm-hmm. And Monet saw it, and we can enter in then into a dialogue about what we see. Right. And that's the the personal aspect of it. That that is the Catholic perspective on beauty being in the eye of the beholder. That it's actually something that I need to experience. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Well, and, and in this way, it's, it's oh, go ahead. Yeah, Sorry. No, no. But also, I mean, sometimes, too, it really depends on the disposition of the individual, because, I mean, even mm-hmm. like, say, you can go to a beautiful orchestra, but if you were rushing and you got there late and you're stressed out, even though it's an incredibly beautiful piece, you might not actually feel touched because you are so stressed out you know um like just as an example for somebody who 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 arrived late that they didn't get to hear the whole piece or whatever it might be and i think too like that's why even when it comes to beauty we have certain um because you know some people in in, with modern art and stuff they just think whatever you want to do it's beautiful but it's like well no because we also need a certain form and structure and i think that's why we even have ritual um because like you even what we were talking about with gregorian chant there's certain modes Loads of things that even if you arrive to mass, let's say, uh, you know, somebody who's just attending, who's not even in the choir, but hearing something that you've heard again for maybe the hundredth time or whatever it might be, but hearing that familiar tone of that chant, it can take you from wherever you've been and no matter what it might be and, and bring you into that mystery of beauty. You know, it allows you to enter into it. So even if you weren't properly disposed when you got there, it can help you to become disposed to, yeah. to that experience so that you can <laughs> um, have that, uh, not that, again, like not that it has to be an emotional experience every time, but it does when we do things properly and in a specific way. Um, for these reasons, I think that that really allows everyone to really enter into it um, and prepare yeah, their heart for absolutely. that. Absolutely, I think that's important that, you know, this aspect of disposition, I often think mm-hmm. of the Psalms, they have ears, but they do not hear. They have eyes, yes. but they do not see. Right. Um, and that mm-hmm. happens to us. We can be blinded by what's actually beautiful by some sort of 
a wrongheaded notion about something mm-hmm. or an ideological predisposition to something or, exactly. you know, maybe a, a memory experience in our memory. There's a really great essay actually by Alice von Hildebrand oh. um, called Wrong, Wrong Approaches to Art. It's really great. I recommend wow. it to anyone. Yes. And it's also modeled in um, a couple of essays by Dietrich von Hildebrand that mm-hmm. the Hildebrand Legacy Project just um, published recently called Beauty in the Light of Redemption, I think it is. Those mm-hmm. are really great essays. Mm-hmm. They can talk about, you know, why is it that we could physically perceive something that is objectively beautiful or hear something that is objectively beautiful and not experience it in that way? Right. You know, um, what are we bringing to the table? And I think, you know, perhaps it's easier for Catholics to understand this in terms of like the moral sphere. You know, right. when we think about ca- Catholic moral theology, we can think about, okay, I can know that a particular thing is wrong to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but as a Catholic, I need to be formed to know that it's it's wrong. You know, maybe right. my conscience is deadened. You know, I have a natural dispos- predisposition to know that it's wrong. But I have to allow myself to be formed by reason right. and by my faith um, to form my conscience, to be sensitized to doing something that's wrong, you know. And in this way, there's a, a formation of conscience that uh, limits our culpability when we do sin. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of the subjective experience of it. And it, it has a sort of corollary in the experience of the beautiful that I, I have to be formed habitually by things which possess beauty, nobility, excellence to really start to see them in a profound and deep way. Right. You know, there is an experience of beauty that is initial and can break through any lack of formation. Right. I go into a church and I am not Christian or I have, you know, some ideological opposition to Christianity, but I see something that's beautiful in a church and I say, wow. Exactly. But then past that experience of, uh, initial experience of, wow, I can be formed by it to see more clearly, to more accurately perceive what's there. Mm -hmm. You know, like I see a stained glass window and I see the beauty of the colors, the beauty of the shape of it, the resplendence with the light pouring through the window. And then I can see um, the figures in it. And then I can know what is the, uh, you know, why is this Old Testament story being paired with that New Testament story and what's the meaning that ties those two stories together. And I can meditate on that for a long time. Something that's beautiful has that initial experience that can captivate beyond anyone's limitations um, in their lack of formation. But then that formation helps us to go deeper and beauty abides with us throughout the lifetime of experience of that. Something that's truly beautiful, I can see or hear again and again and again, and it's able to bear the weight of repetition without me getting sick of it and always feeling like there's a freshness, a newness, that refulgence of the face of the splendor of reality is always there when something is authentically beautiful to accompany us our whole lifetime. Exactly. Yeah, no, I think that's that's so well put about beauty and and what it is in terms of music. Now, also, I think it's always great to, you know, I think we've filled our listeners minds with some amazing um, insight into beauty and music. But a lot of times, you know, people don't have the practical um, know how of like, well, how can I actually apply this to my life? So what's something um, that our listeners can do um, to encourage and support sacred music in their parishes? So um, I would say. First, listen to really great music. Um, mm-hmm. You know, if that's in person, that's the best. If it's not, if you don't have access to that, listen to some really great recordings online. Um, mm-hmm. Listen to really profound masterworks that, you know, someone says is, is an amazing thing to uh, listen to. Maybe it's not something that you would prefer right away, but listen to it. Right. And then seek it out habitually. Be formed by it. Mm-hmm. Be shaped mm-hmm. by it. And, and notice what effect does it have on your sense of recollectedness, carefulness, and listen to it, not doing anything else. Don't mm-hmm. use it as background music, but mm-hmm. really turn your attention to it and then notice those things. Mm-hmm. When you notice those things, go and search out other people who want that in your parish, who are other people who are interested in really thinking with the mind of the church, who want to worship God and bring people to that worship in an experience of beauty. 
seek those other people out, listen mm-hmm. together, talk about it, experience it together, and then think about what you can do. You know, it's different in different situations. I think of a, a dear friend of mine who started a garage scola. Oh, wow. <laughs> and she, <laughs> she was a, you know, someone who had a pleasant voice, but it was kind of quiet and yeah. she didn't have a lot of musical training. Mm-hmm. So what she did was on Friday mornings, she would go to daily mass at her parish Mm -hmm. and there were a bunch of other like nurses who ended up being at this parish. I think it was, you know, near a hospital or something and it worked out really well for their schedule and the shift change. Mm -hmm. And she just would gather these nurses together, print out a bunch of chants. And then um, they would sit in a a room and (laughs) push play in a CD player and listen to it and sing along. Wow. That was what (laughs) she felt like she could do. And uh, they did this for a while. And then they said to the priest, you know, Hey, can we sing the Marian antiphon after daily mass? We're just going anyway. And, and so the priest said, Oh, okay. And then they did it and it sounded beautiful. And the priest said, Oh, you know, like, why don't you do that on a regular basis? And then it evolved into them being able to sing for more things at mass in a way that felt inviting, natural, and not threatening to, you know, any other things going on in the music program. Right. Wow. Well, that's, (laughs) that's definitely one way to do it. So thank you. So then, you know, basically immerse yourself in sacred music and let God lead you through it. Thank you so much, Jennifer. We're definitely going to have to have you back at a future point with all the amazing work that you're doing, um, especially with the Catholic Institute of Sacred Music. Thank you. And you're listening to A Culture of Beauty on Spirit-Filled Catholic Radio Network. We hope you've enjoyed listening to Square Notes, the sacred music podcast with Dr. Jennifer donaldson Novitska. For more information about this episode, sacred music resources, or upcoming events, visit our website at sacredmusicpodcast.com. You can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, or your favorite podcast app. If you enjoy our podcast, please write us a review on iTunes. This improves our iTunes ranking and helps others find out about the podcast. The music you heard at the beginning of this episode is Hec Dies by William Byrd, sung by the London Oratory Schola Cantorum Boys Choir, directed by Charles Cole from the CD Sacred Treasures of England. The music at the conclusion of this podcast is from the Prelude and Fugue in G Major, BWV 550 by Johann Sebastian Bach, performed by Jennifer Donaldson Novitska. We look forward to having you join us next time. And until then, may we sing the praise of his glory.